All right, all right, all right. Good evening, everyone. Is this thing on? Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing tonight? Good, good. I hope you all are feeling just as good as you all are looking. I want to welcome everyone to the Museum of Contemporary Art, MoCA Cleveland, on this fine Thursday night. We, it is a celebration, am I right? You all are here to be a part of a legendary screening of an awesome film titled Walls of Respect, Norman Parrish and the Parrish Art Gallery, and we are joined tonight by a super esteemed guest, one of which is Mr. Norman Parrish III himself, who we'll be hearing from. So let's give Mr. Norman Parrish and his family a round of applause. So we'll hear from him in just a second to introduce the film. But before then, once again, I just want to welcome you to MoCA, a place where we implore folks to be curious, a folks where we celebrate art and artists, and a place where we can come and be as expressive and creative as we dare to be. And I would just want to thank all of you for taking time tonight to be a part of this extraordinary experience. We are partnering uh, not only with Norman Parish, but also with uh, Assembly for the Arts. Has anyone ever heard of Assembly tonight? Anybody from Assembly in the house? And also with the Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival, which concludes tomorrow. So to talk a little bit more about the Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival, we have the creative director, Miss Felicia Haney. Thank you. Keep the, keep the applause going for Joshua, you guys. Oh, I feel so special. Um, as Joshua mentioned, my name is Felicia Haney. I am the creative director of the Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival, also known as GCUF. Do we have any first time GCUFers in here? Is this the first time you've ever been to a GCUF event? All right. Well, welcome. Welcome to day eight of the Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival. Um, as Joshua said, we do conclude tomorrow night at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame will be our closing night with a special world premiere film. So um, hope you guys got tickets to come and check us out. But back to today's events. <laughs> um, I want to introduce uh, why the reason most of you are here, the man of the hour, uh, who is a native Chicagoan, but former Clevelander. He is now back in Chicago working as an editor of the Chicago Sun-Times. Thank you, Deidre. Tiger Nation, thanks for giving me that, that alley-oop. We're classmates. Um, so without further ado, oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to mention something I thought was a very, very cool fact. Other than the fact that you are the associate producer of the film, let's give it up for that. Um, Mr. Parrish, when he was here, his, his time in Cleveland, he said his daughter was born in Cleveland. And also, um, he was the lead reporter on the Jeffrey Dahmer case. I was like, wow, how cool. How interesting, let me say that. <laughs> but I'd love if you come up and um, join us and let us know what we're getting ready to watch here today. Thank you. Thanks, Felicia. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'll give you a self applause for being here. I really appreciate it. And um, and, and Mike was the guy, other guy that worked with me on Jeffrey Dahmer, Mike San Giacomo, who's a cartoon critic. You may have seen a lot of his um, stories in Olivera Perkins, another um, journalist here as well. I think you're covering the, some of the film festival or some, some. okay, all right, all right. Um, but anyway, I wanna thank um, the museum, uh, MOCA, for doing this. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, the Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival, uh, Assembly for the Arts, um, Wildsworth Gerald, who I've known since I was forever. I mean, I remember um, Mr. Gerald when I was a little kid, my father and him would go out to art fairs, um, street fairs, and they would go and sometimes come home late at night, and maybe it typically were like Friday and Saturdays, because you know, they, my father was punching the clock, working a, a regular job. And I wake up in, a, in the morning and, and I go turn on the TV, I, you know, like a typical kid looking at cartoons. And Gerald would be laid out on, a, on our couch because <laughs> he was laid out. I, I wake him up, turn it on the TV with my cartoons. So, you know, but, but anyway, I'm so, so, so thank you um, so much for doing this. Um, 
Um, Mr. Gerald, uh, he's a great artist and he's been a, a good friend uh, since my family's passed, my parents have passed on, so I really appreciate it. Um, Rhonda Brown, uh, thank you also for participating in this project. As you know, um, Malcolm Brown Gallery was an institution here in Cleveland, so I really appreciate her being here. She's an artist herself, and she's a uh, Cleveland's uh, art czar, right? <laughs> for the most part. So, um, so, so thank you uh, for participating in this. And then also uh, uh, David Ramsey, thank you. Um, gallerist, <laughs> creative. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much. And um, also, uh, of course, the person who really got things going for this, you know, I, I called her up while I said, I said, man, what, should I bring the film to Cleveland? What, what do you think about it? He said, talk to Deidre, 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 Deidre. So I talked to Deidre uh, McPherson, and, and thank you so much. I mean, with the Assembly of, of, the, of, of the Arts, uh, McPherson. And then Josh, Josh um, here from MOCA was, you know, really helpful. Me and Josh talked a lot on the phone, so, so thank you so much for helping me out with all of this. I really do. I uh, appreciate your help. And uh, Bobby uh, Reagans, Regans, there's Bobby back there. 23 years old, artist, works here. So, um, you know, Tally, I saw some of her work. She looks, it looks really great. So, so thank you, Bobby. And these are the people who are gonna be on the, on the panel. Of course, my wife and daughter, uh, Valerie's my wife. Ashley's my daughter. We drove up from Chicago, so I really appreciate their support. We've been, uh, this is something we really, you know, I've always uh, wanted to do, basically when my father died in, in 2013, people said, well, you know, why don't you do a film about uh, the gallery and some of the things that happened in the black arts movement? And so I said, well, let me try this. So I went to one place, I went to universities, I went everywhere, and then finally I found a, a professor at Concordia University, she's no longer there now, uh, Susan Erickson, and she got her class involved. This started before COVID, uh, so this is pre-COVID, and so this would have been um, October 2019, September 2019. We actually did interviews in studios and that type of thing. And then what happened around February, March, people started talking about COVID-19, this new thing. And it's like, wow. And so then we stopped the project. Everyone was worried about getting sick, sick which was understandably so. And then we started to um, you know, do some of the interviews by Zoom which I had never knew anything about. Zoom, what's this Zoom thing? I started my jobs with, 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 with through Zoom. So we did some of the interviews through Zoom. And then it, it broke, but eventually, um, well, it was, I guess it's still ongoing right now, but things got better, things opened up. And then we did some of our interviews in person, but we interviewed several people. It took us like three and a half years to, to put this together. And some people who have passed on, um, uh, my father's uh, wife, my stepmother, uh, Gwen Parrish, I talked, she was the first one I talked to. I actually talked to her in Pennsylvania and she's passed on. She never, you know, she never got a chance to see this. Um, one of the people in the film, um, Sadat Ward, my, one of my father's sisters, she's passed on. And some of the other people were, are, are aging as well. I talked to Richard Hunt a couple of times, he, the artist. Uh, and, you know, he, I think I saw him right before he got sick. We interviewed him in person. And then, you know, he's still creating art. In fact, um, he's going to do a piece for the Obama Center um, coming up. So he's still highly productive. Um, so uh, it was timely. It was, I'm, I'm glad we got some people on, on film. I got hours and hours and hours of, of uh, interviews that we did not use. Uh, we we tried to keep it to 30 minutes. It was something, I'm going to mention your book, if anyone wants to write that, that book. But we, I wanted to do something to reach the younger generation because I know that they're so visual. And I wanted to make sure that the, all these artists, my dad, worked with over 170 artists in that 20 years um, time span at the gallery, Parish Gallery in Georgetown. And 90% of these artists that were in there are deserving of their own documentary. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean Wadsworth Gerald, for example, I mean, my goodness, you know, the, the things that he's done in the art world, Afro Cobra, and he's a professor at George, uh, at the University of Georgia, he was a professor at Howard, started Black Arts Movement. And, and one, one thing I found too in, in, from doing this was that a lot of the artists were activists themselves, and um, it's kind of kind of our progressions as 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 black people. A lot of us who were involved in any kind of profession often are are activists. But anyway, with all that said, I'm just giving you a little a little um a little um, background on 
why we were doing this and, and, and some of the people that are involved in this. And so, so thank you. Um, the film itself is about 35 minutes, 36 minutes or so, and I hope you enjoy. And then afterwards, I hope you stick around and enjoy the, the panel discussion. And, and, and um, um, thanks again for everyone for, for supporting us tonight. Thanks. For me, after watching this film, I felt so inspired and empowered by the work of Norman Parrish. He's impacted and given so much to black artists and contributed greatly to the black arts movement. Hearing all of those stories and the way he led his peers and still found time for his own practice leaves me in awe. There's so much to take away from this film and this remarkable conversation coming up. We are now gonna turn it over to our talented panel, in which I have the privilege, privilege of introducing our moderator, and then we'll open the floor for questions after. Our moderator this evening is Deidre McPherson. <laughs> Will everyone that's on the panel come up to Deidre McPherson is the Chief Community Officer at the Assembly for the Arts, a cultural liaison, creative producer, and entrepreneur strategist dedicated to bridging the gap between artists, communities, and institutions. Her passion for recognizing the creative talent in her community and connecting artists to the public through events and opportunities has been at the core of her work. Her advocacy for black and brown and LGBTQ plus creatives enables her to be a prominent force in the collective shift towards equity in Northeast Ohio. Over the years, Deidre has, has held leadership roles at the Cleveland Museum of Art and the Museum of Contemporary Art at Cleveland. At both institutions, she was responsible for curating and managing events designed to make the museum a vibrant, socially relevant and welcoming destination. Similarly, as a director of artistic and community initiatives for FRONT, she introduced community engagement practices that focus on the amplification of black and brown voices. Through her arts consulting practice, she has worked on projects for the Cleveland International Film Festival, Studio West 117, Caramel House, Dance Cleveland, and the Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival. Deidre's journey through the arts began in her youth and was nurtured by her family as she studied the violin. She earned her bachelor's in business administration from Miami University with minors in violin performance and arts administration and an MBA in marketing from the University of Maryland. In her spare time, Deidre enjoys adventuring around Cleveland on her bicycle she serves on the boards of Cleveland Votes, the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, and Sankofa Fine Arts Plus. So without further ado, this panel. All right, my name is Deidre McPherson, and it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you all today uh, and to moderate this panel discussion on behalf of Assembly for the Arts where our mission is to center Cleveland as a great city of the arts and a great city of equity. Uh, I wanna do a few thank yous uh, to Megan Rich and Mocha Cleveland staff who made today's program possible, uh, including Joshua Hill, Bobby Regans, Antoinette Cartman Gay, and Corey Dakin. And also thank you to Donna Dabbs and the Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival for presenting this film. Also, thank you to my colleagues at Assembly for the Arts, President and CEO Jeremy Johnson and Janita Blue, uh, who are here with us this evening. Say hello. <laughs> yes. And I also want to acknowledge that today's event is in honor of the memory of the late 
uh, arts leaders, Norman Parrish of Washington, DC, and the late Ernestine and Malcolm Brown of Cleveland. All right, yes. So our goal with our time today is to hear, um, hear some reflections on the film from our esteemed panel. Uh, we'll talk about the history, legacy, and importance of black-owned art galleries and uh, their, their role in advancing racial equity, both locally and nationally. All right, now it's time to meet our panelists. Okay, Norman Parrish III. Yes. Oh, can you? Can you? Yeah. All right, I'm going to have Ron to help me out with these slides here. <laughs> All right, Norman Paris III, he is the oldest son of the late artist and gallerist Norman Paris Jr. Uh, the younger Paris has worked as a journalist in seven states and written several artist articles on the black arts. He is the associate producer of tonight's film and he resides in Chicago where he is currently a deputy managing director at the Chicago Sun-Times. And Norman is also a former Clevelander, a former reporter for The Plain Dealer. Uh, also, panelist is uh, founder and lead curator of the Deep Roots Experience, David Ramsey. David uh, began his, David is a lifelong resident of Cleveland, uh, growing up on Cleveland's east side. Art began to play an important role in his life uh, with the encouragement of his mother. Using art to curate the culture or to tell community stories has been the motto of Deep Roots Experience since its opening in July 2018. Deep Roots offers free arts programming for youth, and it provides a safe space for black and brown artists to be unapologetically themselves without the pressure to conform to traditional European art experiences. It also brings me pleasure to introduce Rhonda K. Brown. Rhonda is the daughter of Ernestine and Malcolm Brown, co-founders of the Malcolm Brown Gallery, one of the first for-profit black-owned galleries in the United States. The gallery was founded in Cleveland and opened from 1980 to 2011. It represented black master artists, including Romari Bearden, Elizabeth Catlett, Selma Burke, Huey, Huey Lee Smith, and many others. In addition to being a dynamic space for viewing and collecting African-American art, the gallery filled an important gap in the cultural arts sphere where patrons not only learned about African-American art and art movements, they were also able to meet the artists and collect their work. A Cleveland boomerang, Rhonda returned home this summer after being appointed by Mayor Justin Bibb as the inaugural Senior Strategist for Arts, Culture, and the Creative Economy for the City of Cleveland. Rhonda is also an artist with a vibrant painting practice. Before returning to Cleveland, she enjoyed a 28-year career in nonprofit leadership in the city of Chicago. And last and certainly not least, Cleveland-based painter, sculptor, and printmaker Wadsworth Darrell became internationally known as a co-founder and leading figure of the art collective Afrocobra. Born in Albany, Georgia, Wadsworth migrated north to pursue studies at the Art Institute of Chicago in 1965. In 1967, the late Norman Parrish invited Wadsworth and his wife, Jay, uh, who was also an artist, to participate in the creation of the Wall of Respect uh, mural on Chicago's south side. This was a foundational moment that led to the development of the Afrocobra Black Arts Movement. Wadsworth has been a teacher at the University of Georgia and Howard University. His work has been featured in exhibitions at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, Florida A&M University, the Atlanta Contemporary Arts Center, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the Tate Modern in London, just to name a few. His work is in the permanent collections of the High Museum in Atlanta, the Studio Museum of Art in, in Harlem, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. His first museum show in Cleveland was right here at MOCA, MOCA Cleveland in 2015. In 2016, his jazz-inspired painting, Heritage, was acquired by the Cleveland Museum of Art, and it was the basis for a joint exhibition at the Cleveland Museum of Art in 2017 with his wife, Jay Jarrell, a native Clevelander and a fellow Afrocobra artist. Let's give our panelists a warm welcome.
right, let's jump into our discussion. So Norman, uh, can you start by telling us, well, you kind of gave us a bit of an overview in your intro remarks, but um, if you could just give us a brief uh, reminder of how the film came to be and uh, what kind of response the film has gotten from audiences so far. I, I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Thanks again. I want to, I, I, I'm humbled by all of this, so, so thank you. Cleveland's always been so nice to me, so, um, so thank you. I mean, as you mentioned, my daughter is here. Born, she, graduated, she graduated from college. There's a lot of friends. I've, and then, and then I'll get to the story, but I just got to say these things because <laughs> because I've learned to, to to give people their roses when they're when they're around. And I mean, Mike Sanjago, I've known him since the '80s, if you can believe that. When we were reporters in Gary, Indiana, so to, to just have a friend to know people that long that that's that's that's, that's precious. But it was those kind of friendships that my father had, where he knew people for years, and when he you know he was involved in the art world for for a very long time, and. You know, when he died, you know, people there was this huge void in, in at least in, in DC art world and other art circles as well. So people say, well, you know, why don't you? I think I've kind of mentioned a little while earlier, as you as you mentioned, why don't you? You know, do something on your dad, maybe a film or something. And I'm a storyteller. I've been a journalist for almost almost four decades, I guess. And usually, I just pick up the phone and I can call someone, interview them, you know, or beat on their door and just keep, keep pestering them till they'll talk to me and. This was, a little, this was a little different. This was trying to make a film or something that was a little different for me. I'm used to writing stories. And so this was trying to tell a story. And um, it was a hard one because it was family members too, trying to get families. It was, it was, it was a lot of work involved in trying to just reach people. Um, and then after we even recorded some people, we, um, some of them didn't want to sign a release form. So we had some artists that ended up on the... Um, editing floor because they didn't want to, they decided they didn't want to um, um, release the, you know, be part of the film because they thought, you know, well, are you going to cheat me on money and this kind of thing. And, and basically it's been a, a self-financed um, um, project. We haven't, you know, done it. We, when we did it, basically I just wanted people to remember these artists and I wanted them to know that, and especially the, um, the collection that we have at American, uh, American Archives, of, uh, Archives of American Art in D.C., the Smithsonian. It's um, the largest um, archive in the, in the world of, of art. And we wanted to be part of that. And we got, I think there's 10,000 documents that are part of that. And I just wanted people to um, know that black artists did exist, that other artists existed. There was a black man who owned a gallery in Georgetown. And an artist is something that's, that lasts forever. I mean, you can go back and you know start talking about Michelangelo and those kind of guys. And, but you know who was the superstar athlete back there? I don't know. <laughs> uh, if you go down to the pyramid time, if you look at the pyramid, the beautiful artwork, and so that was one of the reasons why we did this, too, because art is something timeless, and I wanted to make sure it wasn't forgotten. And and so um, I'm I'm really appreciative to, to the people who did participate and, and helped me out a lot with this, and um, took a lot of time and. Um, Appreciate my wife putting up with this, you know, tied up my weekends. I was always busy for you know for a few years. So 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 thanks thanks again. So Wadsworth, uh, the title of the film uh, "Walls of Respect" is in reference to the historic Wall of Respect mural in Chicago that you helped to create. Uh, the film title is also also in reference to the walls of an art gallery. Uh, in 1968, you and your wife, Jay, opened the WJ Gallery and Studio below your home. Uh, can you please describe the energy of the time? Uh, did you see these spaces of community and creativity as a form of activism? Yes, yes. Um, we lived there. It was a studio. Um, it was a conglomerate of studios. It was more than one and I called it studios, I put an S on it. It was a historical place um, that a sculptor built for the 1910 uh, World's Fair. And it was just a relic really was left over from that. And uh, if it hadn't been in an impoverished neighborhood, <clears throat> I never would have been able to rent it. So when, when I went to see it, Fred Jones introduced me to it, who, who, was in, who was in an art show with me. 
And I went over to see it, and it had, you know, it was a real studio. It had skylights and all of these things, not the little bubble. It had um, panes that was 20 inches long and uh, 20 inches wide and had reinforced by chicken wire. And it was double studio. It was one had... 16 panes on one side, and on my side it had um, eight panes. And someone had, a painter had rented the studio, or uh, bought it really, and after the sculptor died, and he put a floor in between. So there was an upstairs and downstairs on the part I was renting in the beginning. And an artist that was teaching classes at night um, was renting the large studio on the other side. And after, <clears throat> after he left, Jay and I got married and we took over the whole, whole both studios. And um, th this was like in the 60s when the energy was, everything was electric, you know, there was a lot of there was a lot of um, recruiting for people to sit in uh, um, on my street. <clears throat> and I told them that I will not, you are not looking for the right person you want to sit in. I'm not trained to have people blow smoke in my face or spit on me and stuff like that. Because <clears throat> I would return it, so anyway. <laughs> anyway, I told them that I will participate in the movement through my art. And this is what we did, you know. So we started Epic Cobra. After we did the Wall of Respect, we started Epic Cobra, which was in the heart of the black community, um, that we had busloads of people coming over and, and, and the people in the neighborhood, some of them came sometimes, but I mean, they all knew us and, and you know, they respected us and we respected what we was doing for the community. And so we opened up a gallery, um, which was, Upstairs and downstairs. The, the place had two floors in it. Um, downstairs was all concrete floor, and on both sides, one side was 30 by 30 feet, two stories tall, and the side I rented first was 15 by 30 feet, which had two floors. And also a bedroom had been suspended over the large studio, which I slept in. And Jay and I remodeled it. Uh, we was dating, and she helped me remodel it a lot. And uh, Norman helped me first. Norman Parrish helped me in the beginning to do some remodeling on it. <clears throat> and it was, you know, when I went in, it was in bad shape. No one had lived in it in seven years. Um, there was a janitor in there for the, for the, the big house was in the front, which Fred Jones, the uh, artist, was renting. There was a guy hosing down all of the cobwebs when I first saw it. <clears throat> and I went upstairs and saw the skylights, and it sort of blew my mind. It was like, uh, a parish studio, things that I had seen in a movie. And incidentally, it was modeled after an, an eminence of a parish studio, which was uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's, Ed, I mean Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright's teacher was said to have built the studio. So it had a lot of history to it also. And um, so we put on a lot of exhibits, um, Africa members, uh, different people all around, anybody. But we didn't have, like Norman had, we just, you know, it was sort of homey. 
because we lived there, you know. So people would come to see a show. We would be downstairs eating dinner. <laughs> you know? so, 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 you know, just, okay, go ahead and see the show, go upstairs and however you want to see it. So. <laughs> but it was really not a lot of profit that we made. We was not doing it for profit, actually. And uh, we also booked the AACM musicians. Um, there was a lot of uh, com uh, collaboration between the musicians, the jazz musicians, and, and the artists of the time. Right. They, they asked could they perform on Sunday, Sundays there. And they would give me percentage of the gate, what I took from, from the art gallery, which was something like 40%. But that was great, you know, and um, we had a lot of music and they would open up exhibits for us. We had poets that would open up, you know, famous poets that would open up the shows for us. Um, everything was really great. It was, it was an electric kind of time during that time. I can't imagine just the, this renaissance period that you were experiencing with poetry, the jazz, and the visual art. Um, very historic, uh, which leads me to a question I have for David. Uh, like everyone else on this panel, I, I know you have a deep love for black history and culture. Uh, what inspired you to open an art gallery and what's special about where Deep Roots Experience is located? So I grew up, my mother and I have three older sisters and all of them were dancers and dancers at relatively high levels. My sister was a dancer at CSU. My sister, my other sister started a dance group at Kent State, which still dances now. She's old, so that dance group is about 25 years old, which is pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> but early on, right, uh, my, my mother instilled in me the value of artwork, and I grew up east side of Cleveland on Rose Hill, uh, right down the street from Buckeye Plaza. And so there were, were always people in my community that recognized uh, that 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 my interests were different, right, uh, and and encouraged me. I can remember at the time being upset that uh, some of the the guys in the neighborhood would tell me, "No, nah, go go sit on the porch and draw, go sit on the porch and, and write," uh, and and you know hindsight, recognizing that that was their way of instilling in me and and telling me that it was my job to to take that step, right? It was my job to 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 be more than what. Uh, existed in, in, in that space. Um, by way of, you know, the, the gallery and where it's located, I, I grew up there. I went to St. Adelbert, which is Catholic school right down the street. My first introduction to basketball uh, was at Fairfax, which is right across the street. Uh, some of my closest friends live in the neighborhood now, and so it is extremely familiar to me, but, but it also put in front uh, for me that there was no awareness around art uh, in, in that space, and particularly black art, right? Or art what created by black and brown people, that it didn't exist in the same way. Uh, and and I, I spent some time traveling uh, and went to Atlanta uh, and, and got a chance to meet Maya Bailey, who is the owner of City of Ink and Peter Street Station, right? Um, Godfather, a black tattoo artist, really well known. And I spent two years kind of interning for the anniversary show. So I fly down just to work. Uh, and, and I remember the first time I went down, their hip hop, right? Mike Flo, DJ for Dead Presidents, right? And if you know who Mike Flo is, tattoos all over his face, he's fairly intimidating. Uh, and and I, I saw him talking to an older gentleman in three-piece suit, hat, feather, full nine. And they were standing there just talking about art. And I said, I've never seen anything like this, right? It was the impact of art to create real, tangible, palatable space for different generations to find cohesion and find uh, a pathway to communication. And, and I realized that that was something that Cleveland deserved. 
uh, that, that I wanted to see and that could be done differently, right? Deep Roots is not the first or the only black gallery or black owned and operated gallery in Cleveland. Uh, we, we do pride ourselves on creating pathways for a more organic experience. Uh, and, and much of that you know, can be attributed to my experiences in Atlanta with Kevin Wack Williams, uh, Charlie Palmer is another artist, right? Having an opportunity to sit and talk to them about their journey and about uh, how the Atlanta art scene was birthed, uh, what work they did to do that, and, and in real time, what I needed to learn coming back to Cleveland to do it. Uh, because Cleveland is much different from Atlanta, right? Uh, you know, 46% or so of Cleveland, uh, black or brown people, uh, and, and we find ourselves often outside of, of art conversations and serious art conversations, right? And so uh, it was an opportunity for us to, to start to change the narrative. It was, it was shared with me by an artist that the thing that was always offered to them were walls. Well, what happens for the artists if you no longer can suck them in by just offering them walls, right? Uh, it was an opportunity to empower the artist to provide them with the space to feel comfortable saying no because they know there's something available for them that's real, that is respected, that is uh, growing, right? And has their, their artwork and the curation of that uh, in, in mind in front. Thank you, thank you. So um, everyone has heard the term starving artist. Uh, traditionally, black people aren't encouraged to pursue careers in the arts, uh, largely because uh, these starving artist stereotypes. Um, we're often encouraged to pursue careers in you know, medicine or in law or in education. So uh, similarly, the idea of art collecting as a form of wealth building isn't really an idea that many of us are exposed to. Uh, Rhonda, I was wondering if you could uh, tell us what it was like for you watching your father own a successful art gallery and, and what did you learn from your parents uh, how did it influence who you are today? Well, thank you for that, that very um, important question, but I, I need to correct you that because my father, um, as many of you know who, who might have known him, was very shy, tall um, gentleman with um, a powerful uh, hand that would create art, but he was not the, the motivating force behind the success of Malcolm Brown Gallery. It was my mother. Um, and um, behind every great man, perhaps, is a fabulous woman <laughs> who is the engine behind what is happening, and that was Ernestine Brown. And so, um, you know, I can share what I learned from my mother, uh, because I think I possess a lot of her attributes as I'm um, returned home from Cleveland and meeting lots of people and saying, boy, oh boy, you are exactly like your mother. Um, she was quite charismatic. She was um, really able to um, convince um, folks to um, come to Cleveland and show their work there. Um, and I would say that because my parents together spent a lot of time carting us around as kids, um, because the opportunities for black artists were very few and far between, um, so she would, um, ensure that we were all packed up with our, our picnic boxes of chicken and potato salad and, and pound cake on our way to Virginia Beach to um, show my dad's work um, at a number of the outside art festivals. And so she was a consummate researcher. She was a consummate businesswoman. My mother had her um, degree in business administration. She was a distributive education teacher which was, in short, business at Lincoln West and John Hay here in Cleveland. And she just really took very seriously the art of creating a strong business model for the gallery. Um, I have every single, um, you know, kind of the books that, you know, bookkeepers keep. She kept beautiful books, handwritten, um, money in, money, money out, in pencil. Um, and they're all filed within our house. It's quite incredible. So 
that um, kind of discipline and consistency and focus on excellence was what my parents was about. And much like Norman, uh, father, Mr. Parrish, my father was also an artist, um, a watercolorist, in fact. And, um, you know, he did not mind that his work was really in the background, um, you know, adjacent to Huey Lee Smith and Romare Bearden and Elizabeth Catlett and uh, Mo Brooker and Selma Burke um, and the many, many artists that were a part of the gallery. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was like a match made in heaven for them, you know. Um, and um, so I have um, abs I absorbed a lot of that energy. I was, I was part of that as a, as a youngster. In fact, um, I have two brothers. I'm the youngest of three. And the gallery opened on my birthday, September 18th, 1980, um, which was pretty special. And, you know, as your parents begin to get sick and pass on, um, and it's you know fascinating to hear the stories of everybody here on the panel and how they came to be. I'm so fascinated by what you're saying, Mr. Durrell, about you and Jay, and and um, you know in Chicago where mm. I just left and I knew Carol Adams, you know. Mm. So it's just all of this like this constellation of things kind of occurring at once. It's really fabulous. But just to to be a part of this this historical conversation and understanding that. Um, we're, we're here because um, we were very much left out of the canon of art. And all of us still today are trying to create important space for African American artists and artist movements uh, because we haven't yet gotten to where we need to be. So thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, Norman, I'm going to ask you the same question. What was it like for you watching your father own a successful art gallery, and what was it about uh, that experience that kind of influenced who you are today? I, I guess I'm, I was really, I was, I was happy that he was able, in the film he says he's satisfied, he, you know, and he, he struggled so much you know, trying to, to make it as an artist, him and, you know, black art, other black artists. And um, I was glad to, that number one, he ventured out to, to try that. I mean, it started because he couldn't find someone to show some, um, some landscape paintings that he you knows beautiful out there in Maryland, uh, the mountains out there in the DC area. And so someone said to me, why don't you start your own gallery? And so he tried and as, you know, um, Waswell Gerald said, you know, he started out with some Chicago artists and, and um, you know, and the other thing he did that was really, that was really good, and I said he surrounded himself with a lot of other people, a lot of other artists, advisors. You saw Roy Lewis in there, E.J. Montgomery, they would give him a lot of advice. I think within two or three months, what he did was, because he was trying to promote his, 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 the artist's work, he had a, some of the paintings were sent to like Paris, you know, within two or three months, they were they were sent to other countries around the world. He he, he was always thinking globally, and so that inspired me. That 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 made me think as a as a as a human being to get more involved in community organizations, which I did. You know, I, I tried to stay involved with journalism organizations, and um, you know, but I was personally I was just glad that he had something that he really enjoyed, that he was. He, he was succeeding in what he was doing, he, but there were a lot of tough times. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, rent is not cheap in Georgetown. He picked that area so they could be on his hot, on this big platform, but it was expensive, and a lot of times he had, he struggled to make the ends meet. And so, um, you know, my dad, he was a good artist. He was, he was never rich. He never made it. You know, he he looked he looked well. He, he kept you know, but he he was really passionate about art. Passionate about seeing other black artists have a venue to showcase their work, passionate about expanding black arts in, in, into other areas, because many of the people who worked, he started um, interns. He had interns who started uh, under him who became leaders in, in the art world. Um, there was, I was looking at a book here. He, had a, he put out an anniversary book and um, on some of his shows. And I was looking at, um, 
one of the artists in here, one of the uh, writers in here, and it was a woman, um, here is Sandy Belvany. She was executive director of the Reginald Lewis Museum, and then she had other positions that uh, she, she wrote this little forward here in the gallery, on his, on his, uh, celebrating the, the anniversary of his gallery. And, you know, she was one of his interns at Howard University. Howard University was there, and so he, 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 he brought a lot of students and gave them opportunities to um, explore the, the art world so we could get people to become curators and, you know, be people like you, <laughs> so that, 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 which is great because I can see the, the influence of, of you, know, what, you know, how important you are. And so, um, so the gallery was a, was a venue he could use to, to help in, 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 in blacks in, in the art world. That, that was, and I was, I was just glad to, to see him do that. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Wadsworth, a question for you. Um, do you recall when you had shows at the uh, Norman Parrish Gallery and, and, and uh, what, what did having your work on view at a Black-owned gallery mean to you at that time in your career? Um, yes, I recall when he, when he first opened up, he, he drove down, I was living in Atlanta at the time, he drove down to Atlanta, he called me up and told me opening up a gallery and asked me for some work, so he drove down and picked the work up. Uh, uh, I was in his very first show, in his very first brochure he made, it was black and white, and I had a piece that was on the back of it, and some woman saw it and she bought it, mm -hmm. and, I, and I needed the money real bad because my two daughters was in the going to the Art Institute of Chicago at the time, and their tuition was due. And I had stopped working. Uh, I was making a living at a, as an artist. I had left the University of Georgia. I taught for 16 years. And I was making a lot of money uh, as an artist in Atlanta, and I decided to stop teaching. But you know, then there are areas where working you get a steady salary. Uh, when you're working for yourself, you're selling art, you might, there are some dry periods there. So anyway, she, that was the first exhibit I was in, and, and the brochure was in black and white. <clears throat> I have a copy of it somewhere at home now. But, um, and at the time, see, I started off when I was in the Art Institute showing in, in black galleries, small, small black galleries in, in Chicago. I showed in uh, several of them, more than I did the mainstream galleries. I only showed in a, in a mainstream gallery, uh, <clears throat> was up on Michigan Avenue later in my career, but most of the places I showed were small African-American galleries. Some of them was like storefronts, you know. Um, but it was, it was great to, to show at Norman's um, because he had, um, he had a place, you know. It was a marketplace and he gave the opportunity to a lot of people that never would have shown otherwise. Um, so, you know, and I was very happy to, to show there and uh, for him to show my work to, to DC, although I had lived in DC, but I had never had an exhibit per se in a gallery in DC. I had had them in Virginia and in some government offices that had exhibits, but not, not in a commercial gallery uh, until his gallery. Yeah, Rhonda kind of, thank you, Wadsworth. Rhonda had kind of touched on that, uh, how, how there's just a lack of representation and, and not, not a whole lot of opportunity. So these spaces were, were incredibly important. Um, in the film, uh, artist Augie Ogburn uh, described how Norman promoted his show uh, during the, this jazz festival in DC. Uh, Norman loved jazz and he understood the popularity of the festival. So he placed flyers on the seats 
of every seat in the in the concert venue because you know there wasn't any social media at the time. So, uh, Norman, uh, I was wondering what other types of efforts did your father take to introduce potential buyers to black artists? He he really tried to u utilize the media a lot. Um, he formed relationships and partnerships with um, the the black press in in Washington D.C. and also in Baltimore. He also developed a relationship with a couple of um, critics at the Washington Post. So they uh, wrote a lot of um, articles about some of the artists who came there. He also even went beyond conventional media per se to um, advertise or promote their work. And uh, for example, you saw maybe in a, in a film there was a cover of a magazine, the National Medical Association. Uh, that represents the, the nation's black um, doctors. And they have a magazine and for several months, he would have the, on the cover, uh, various artworks on the cover of the, of the artwork. And these are black doctors, so this, you know. And in fact, you saw uh, Waswell Gerald's artwork on the cover of one of them. So he, he, he and then he also formed a lot of relationships with the other galleries, other artists, um, all the institutions you talked, you talked about, um, Janetta Cole, he, he, he was, he was uh, Howard University. He, and then he traveled and brought artwork to other um, places, um, like Navy Pier in Chicago has a annual exhibit. He, he brought functions like that. And so he really, really tried, I mean, he would take some of the artwork to other countries. I remember he, told, he, he took some of your work, Gerald, to, uh, was it, I can't remember if it was Paris, maybe? He, was, he, was, he really liked, uh, <laughs> Gerald stuff. He, he took some of your work to Paris, man, and it was just to, to show it there, and so that was a one way to to promote the the, the artist, and and um, so he he tried to I guess it was um, conventional ways, but also unconventional ways of to promote the art, and he tried to form partnerships with all types of um, black groups and people who might have disposable income to spend on art. And I mean, he formed relationship with some pro athletes, for example, um, uh, Calvin Hill, you may know him, he used to play with the Dallas Cowboys, his son is Grant Hill, they're big time art collectors. And um, in fact, in one of these books, he, he writes um, his views about American art. And so he tried to, that was one way he tried to um, stay in business, promote art, artists, and, 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 and um, so it's more than just putting leaflets on 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 um, on chairs at a at a concert or at, at an, um, um, outside pluggers on cars, but he, he did whatever he could to promote the art. He would go on radio stations in in, in the D.C. area and talk about art, and, um, and then eventually he actually became head of the art association that represented all the galleries, white and black. And so um, he did that for a while. And so he was he was deep, he got deeply rooted into. Um, uh, D.C. and in, 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 in art. Uh, he also um, had contact with uh, art critics, like from the Washington Post, would come out and write an article on artists that was exhibited. Right? No, on the exhibit. So getting those reviews in in the mainstream yeah. newspapers was another yeah. way of uh, bringing attention to the space and uh, the many talented artists who displayed work there. Um, Rhonda, uh, given your new role at, at the City of Cleveland, I have to ask, uh, what role do art galleries and exhibitions uh, play in supporting local artists and having um, our local, and supporting our local creative economy? So I, I think a couple things about that. I mean, it is the responsibility of gallery dealers to promote and um, create articles and content about their artists so that they continue to grow um, and scale their careers, their prices, et cetera, so that they can actually um, live, um, do their, you know, kind of live, make a living wage or a livable wage as artists. So that is really the role of the galleries to promote the artists, to have robust lists of uh, patrons that are interested in making purchases um, to be a part of the conversation around what's happening in the art world. Um, in addition, um, there's lots of um, ways in which um, galleries, um, institutions, and um, um, art dealers can really help catapult 
um, artists to the next level. Um, as it relates to the creative economy, I mean, we, we know that, um, you know, galleries and institutions are really, you know, if you're a visual artist, you're taking several steps to get to that level where you have um, museum shows, retrospectives, and ultimately are published as you've got this book here by um, Wadsworth Jarrell with all of the work um, from Afrocobra. And there was that incredible show that traveled around um, the country that took a look at, you know, the wide range or the impact of Af Afrocobra um, well beyond, um, you know, its its heyday. Um, so, I mean, I think that there's, there's um, you know, an important role that black dealers played um, you know, they were a voice for the voiceless, um, and I think they continue to be um, that important um, space where artists who are not um, getting opportunity to have opportunity and um, provide that um, platform to elevate and lift up the wide range of um, brilliance that exists um, through um, black American arts and the diaspora. Thank you. So thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. Uh, David, I'm going to ask you the same question uh, with, your, with your gallery and, and operating Deep Roots. Uh, you've really opened doors for artists who, to have their first exhibition and, and artists who have continued to grow their career after uh, you provided oftentimes that first opportunity. Uh, what role do you see uh, galleries uh, and, and the exhibitions that you organize as a curator, what role does that play in supporting our local creative economy? You know, the, the, the first thing I'll say is that I don't know that I, I recognize or see us as providing opportunity in that way, right? These are artists who have created the work, they put their heart and soul in the work and the opportunity to work with them, right? The opportunity to collaborate on placement and arrangement and installation and telling their story uh, has, has really been the, the driving force in continuing to do the work. Uh, when we think about the economy, uh, the, the art economy has changed a bit over the years and for, for many black and brown artists, I encourage uh, the, the idea of leveraging the ownership of the images to uh, do lease agreements, right, to do prints, uh, to, to find pathways to make collecting art more accessible, right? Uh, I, I spent some time in Atlanta with Kevin Wack Williams and one of the things that, that, that he told me as a joke was that he got a million dollar house selling prints. It's not inaccurate, right? Uh, he spent a lot of time at festivals centered around black and brown people, uh, and they purchased his prints, and he followed people through their careers. So uh, you'd have someone who would start off with a $100 print, and after that $100 print, they got a raise at work, and then they moved on to a Jaclay print. And then after that Jaclay print, they got another raise, and they moved on to payment plans for originals, right? It is the intentionality of trusting that the work that speaks to us should be available for us. And, and similarly to some of the, the sentiments that were, were shared in the documentary, uh, we offer payment plans for, for our artwork. Uh, we as a culture, uh, and, and specifically black Americans, we collect art. We just identify art differently, right? When you see a black person with a pair of shoes that they keep clean, right? That's art. When you see uh, a black person with a nice handbag, that's art for us. Uh, the, the, the role currently for Deep Roos is, is encouraging people to identify art outside of just those, I, those, those areas and really start to, to feel connected to, to canvas work, to uh, sculpting, to collage work you know, work that can live with their family and, and recognizing that this is now a new pathway for us to, to share uh, and deliver our culture uh, and, and the history of our culture, right? As we look through these photos and the artwork from, from Wadsworth, we, we immediately recognize that it's not just 
the story of his art, but it's the story of his generation, right? It's the story of the, the culture that existed there. And, and it's one of the best ways for us to stay connected to that uh, and share that with our children and our grandchildren is through collecting and willing art to our families. Thank you. So uh, in closing, I, I, was, I have one final question for each of you. Um, kind of what's next? Uh, Norman, um, now that you've shared this story uh, with your, of your father's legacy uh, with this very special gallery that he operated for many years, um, is there another story that you're looking to tell uh, in, about the art world? Sure. Um, first off, we've shown it in several cities. I showed it first in, in Georgetown, where, where this gallery was. We showed it in um, Chicago at the DeSalvo Museum. Showed it in the uh, Indianapolis Art Museum. Showed it at Southern Illinois University. So we showed it up, and then here, this is this is, this is the warmest <laughs> place. To, I, I love this one. This is, this is the best showing. But because uh, I mean, especially with Wildsworth Gerald being here, I mean, this is this is a gem. I know my dad. He's, he's got to be looking. He's smiling and looking at this. And so, but but to, I would like to do a book to, to just to, to 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 get more detailed, um, and then. I like to do um, more storytelling in not just in arts, but more things that deal with black history. Um, that's, that's, you know, in, newspa in newspaper world, they always ask history's first rough draft, so that, which, it, which it really is. But I want to dig into so many different stories of, of, of our people that are not being told. And I want to continue to do that. I really want to um, pursue that as, as much as I can. And whether it's through a books or whether it's through film, whatever, that's, that's kind of really something I like to do. Right now, I'm, I'm an editor at the Sun Times, so I kind of more or less um, help um, other journalists put out work to, to tell stories. And then I've been doing a lot of hiring. I've, in fact, part of, part of all of this is, I, I guess I look at it in a bigger, bigger picture when I look at it, uh, storytelling that in, and you've certainly seen the changes happen, seen, seen them happen here in Cleveland. But basically, I want to see, uh, I want to see our stories told, and not just, and, and just overall as a democracy. When we, when you look at all the cuts that are happening in American journalism, I work with a group called um, Report for America. I was the director of recruitment, and there were, you had places like Fort Worth, uh, Texas. I'm going off place. I'm going off the beaten bat, but but I'm trying to, I'm, but and they had. No matter what your political position may be, there were places that they would find out if their water bill was going up when they got the bill. It wasn't something that was in a newspaper. That's why American journalism is so important. I mean, local journalism is as important. So I want to continue to also promote local journalism. We, where I work now, we become nonprofit. We've combined with the station WBEZ one of the largest nonprofit newsrooms in the country. And we've been, because of that, we have grants and people are able to contribute to um, our journalism. And so we've been able to do a lot of hiring. I've been involved in, in helping to hire people. In fact, that was one of the things today we were talking about, I had a meeting today on a Zoom meeting with some colleagues at the Sun-Times discussing a particular position we're, we're trying to fill. And so I want to see more of that because there's been so many cuts in, in American journalism, so that's limited our storytelling, the ability to tell stories. And so I want to expand on that. I want to continue to be involved in that process, but then also be involved when I get a chance to tell stories on my own or be or collaboratively with other people. So that's that's where, where I'm headed in the future. And um, you know, and, 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 and I've and, and while I was tell you, I've even told stories about him. I've written stories uh, about Afro Cobra for um, the Crisis Magazine, that's the NAACP Magazine. So I've tried to, and with the arts, because of what I've seen as a, growing up, I, I'm always trying to pr promote black artists. You had, uh, was uh, Bay, he just had a show that opened at, the, at a gallery that just opened. You know, I wrote a story on him for Crisis Magazine. So I try, I'm trying to continue to tell our stories in, in the arts, <laughs> but, but just generally our, our overall story. So. Thank you, thank you. Uh, how about you, Rhonda? What's next? Uh, and I've kind of got an important role, but um, also thinking about uh, the legacy of your parents. Are you thinking about continuing that at some point? Absolutely. Um, being here has just deepened my connection to what um, the incredible work that they were doing. Um, 
at some point I may be a gallery owner myself. Um, and um, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Rhonda. Wadsworth, uh, I have your book up here. Is there another, another uh, story or are you continuing to create uh, at this time in your career? Yes, um, almost every day, but um, uh, I would put it like um, an artist that I knew in New York. Someone asked him that, he says, I do it every day so I don't forget how to do it. <laughs> but, you know, you know, I have other obligations, of course, and, um, but this is what I do. This is what I always wanted to do all of my life when I was a little boy. So it's like a dream come true to me. It's like being in fairyland, you know. That's beautiful. Uh, well, yes, we want to see more work from you, so that's, that's really good to hear. Uh, David, we'll give you the last word. Uh, do, do you have any shows coming up? What should we be looking for from Deep Roots Experience? Yeah, so we, we've, we've got some shows coming up in October. Uh, October 13th, we open Brown Burlesque, uh, which is an opportunity for us to explore uh, the intimacy and the, um, the participation of black and brown people in burlesque culture. Um, you know, more work, more fire, right? We, we strive to create uh, experiences and opportunities for artists. Um, thankful that some of the artists who have trusted us with their, with their work are here. Bobby, uh, Krista, I think I saw sneak in here. Uh, Asia, who is the photographer for Brown Burlesque, um, but also a phenomenal collage artist, uh, Aja, like we were just talking about, right, what the next steps are. Uh, our, like what's next is more, like more fire, right? Like more of the greatness that currently exists uh, and, and being inspired by watching these super talented artists uh, create and elevate, learn uh, and, 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 and rinse and repeat. All right. All right, thank you so much. So I think we have time for a handful of questions from the audience. Uh, Bobby will be coming around with a mic in case anyone has any burning questions in the audience by a show of hands. Yes, we have one. I am intrigued with the personal relationships that either preceded a gallery artist relationship in the case of Mr. Gerald's or that happened as a result of the collaboration. And my question was prompted by a memory, if I remember correctly, Rhonda, your mother shared with me that your family became personal friends with Elizabeth Catlett, is that right? And you spent a considerable amount of time there. So I was curious um, how that theme plays out and, and maybe any memories that you have. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I um, have very fond memories of meeting a lot of the master artists. When I met um, Romer Beard and I was very young and I was very scared of him because he was a large man and he looked like Gorbachev. And um, what was painted in the, the um, news about Gorbachev was that he was a very bad person, so I thought Romer Bearden was a bad person too. Um, Elizabeth Catlett, dear friend of my family's, and uh, I went to the Ohio State University. I spent my sophomore year in Cuernavaca fall uh, completing my language credit. And that just happened to be where her and Pancho lived. So I spent a lot of time at her house swimming, um, would go to her um, studio. And you know, one day when I was in the pool, she's like, can I take some photographs of you? And I'm like, sure. I mean, I was really looking completely insane, but she, she wanted to take some photographs. And at a later show um, that she had at the gallery, she bought a, a, a beautiful um, pencil um, graphite drawing portrait of me, which I have. And, um, you know, I know her sons, Huey Lee Smith's kids, you know, just the lots of relationships that emerged and were established. Of course, as a kid, you take those for granted until you want to be an artist and you're like, wow, that was my life. So, um, yeah, I do feel very fortunate 
um, to have had those experiences as a young, as a young woman, as a child, in fact. That was a great question. I'm looking around to see if there are any other hands. There's one in the back. Is that Michael Russell? Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Gerald, I, uh, I, would be, I would be remiss not to acknowledge you and say thank you. What's one thing that you would give to creatives who are coming up in this atmosphere? You coming from the generation that you're from and looking at the generation that you're, that you're, in, that you're present with today, What's something that you would say, hey, young fella, hey, young lady, hey, them, hey, they, the, the human being, what would you say to them today? Um, if I'm advising someone that's an artist, I would say, or anything else, I would say, first of all, you have to be, take, seri take yourself serious your work serious, not yourself necessarily, but take your work serious. And it, and it takes a lot of energy and stamina to, you have to do it almost every day. You have to eat, sleep, and all the time think about it. And, and, and this is how you can be successful. Um, you turn down a lot of invitations for entertainment, all kinds of things. When, when I was in Chicago, I had a studio. Um, I would be working on Sundays, Saturday nights, holidays, and my friends would come over and say, what are you doing working on holidays? But this was, I was dedicated to what I was doing. So this is how you have to take, take an approach to your life, you know. Once you... To me, once I became an artist, um, that was my whole life. You know, it uh, it takes it takes over everything. You know, I had become I had become something, and I had to work to keep it um, expanded. To you know, keep inventing, keep inventing. You know. Well, sir, do you mind if I, if we you? We share with them your age. Beg your pardon. Your age. If you, now you should share with the group your age. I didn't hear. Your age. What's your age? What's your age? My age. Yeah. Ninety-three. Woo. Ninety-three years young and still creating. So create art every 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 day. Okay. Do we have one last question? Oh, we have one out here. If I stand up, I'll panic, so I'm not going to stand up, okay? Um, I wanted to say that uh, when I heard about the whitewashing of the mural, it kind of made me sick. I think it would make anyone feel kind of sick, art being destroyed like that, um, especially that, that type of how important that piece was. Um, but if only that person knew what he had done. Do you know what I mean? Because a light bulb went off when I heard that, and he opened the floodgates in reality. You know what I mean? Like, it inspired possibly millions of pieces of art, and it displayed thousands, you know, and it, it's funny, God works in mysterious ways, you know, and is that how you view it sometimes? Because at the time, it would make, it would, must have been profoundly devastating. I would have been, I would, I'm an essayist, I'm a writer, I'm a literary artist, I'm with Cuyahoga Community College, um, but um, yeah, so is, how do you view that today? Like, being on both sides of it, you know, the, the torment and the beauty that is it kind of motivated and or brought forth. So, so I'm sorry. You're asking how he felt, or how do, you view it today? How do I view what happened today? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, he was he was upset. He was not happy. He was he was he was really upset. And I mean, well, <laughs> Gerald knows that he was really upset. And so. Well, he kept working. I mean, that was, that was, I mean, Gerald, we, we, we talk about things. He talk, talk, we talk a lot about art that they were involved in. And that, after that happened, he continued to create art. 
he went on to the next project. And it, he didn't, that didn't stop him, he was unhappy, but he went on to another project shortly after that and continued to create art. Um, and then, as you see in the film, he went on to promote art. So, but no, that didn't, that didn't stop him. It was, it was frustrating, it was something that was negative, it was something that was bad, but he moved forward. And so, um, was that something that... Yeah, that's right. Good, good comment. That's a great comment. No, 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 thank you, thank you. It was a good comment. It was a, it was a great comment, it was, it was, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, thank you all so very much. Thank you to the Greater Cleveland Urban Film Festival. Thank you, Mocha Cleveland, and thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. Good night.